Amen and amen. Okay. Now we talked about Joshua. Uh, okay. Is the sound okay? Okay. So we talked about Joshua, a missionary who is on a mission in Japan. But he is not the only one who is on a mission. We all are. Amen? You may not be called to be a missionary by God, but if you are a Christian, you are called by God on a mission. And we've looked at the order that Jesus himself gave us in Matthew 28. Let's read that again. Then Jesus came to them, that's the disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Share the gospel so people become Christians. Make Christians of people in all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is our mission. If you claim to be a Christian, then he, God has sent you on this mission. And this is not a suggestion. This is not a suggestion that we can opt out or opt in. This is a command that needs to be obeyed. And so let me ask you, are you obeying or disobeying your orders from God? Looks like Mm. Are you obeying or disobeying your orders from God? If you have shared the gospel to someone in order to bring that person to a saving faith in Christ, or at least you have brought someone to church so that you, they will hear the gospel here, then you have obeyed the Lord you claim to believe in. Otherwise... We are disobeying him. And his word for us is, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As far as God is concerned, it's all or nothing. We can't choose which commandment of God that we want to follow and then choose to reject the others. It's all or nothing. If you notice in verse 20, in verse 20, and this is where you are at if you are a Christian. And notice the sequence of the commandments of God. First it says, make disciples, make people believe in Christ. Now if you're listening to this message and you are not a Christian, the first thing you need to do is to repent of your sins and make Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you've already done that, then you need to be water baptized. Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is to express your faith publicly that you are a child of God. And then it's not just enough to profess your faith. You need to live it out. That's why Jesus says, teach them. Who is them? Those who are saved and are baptized. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus didn't say, teach them some of the things I have commanded you. Jesus didn't say, teach them to obey most of the things I have commanded you. He says what? Teach them to? Hello? Obey what? Everything. That I have commanded you. Teaching them to obey everything. Everything means all that God has commanded us. If Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Amen? I'm thinking about the little boy. You may have heard of this story before. Who was standing on the chair as the whole family were having dinner. And his father told him, that is not proper. We are having dinner. You don't stand on the chair. You sit down. But the boy didn't listen. He continued standing on his chair. And the father repeated his instruction. I told you to sit down. Don't stand on the chair. Still the boy didn't listen. 
Finally, in exasperation, the father told the boy, if you don't sit down, I'll knock you down. The boy sat down, but he said to his father, I'm sitting down, but inside, I'm standing up. <laughs> now, I hope we're not that stubborn. Amen? I hope we're not that stubborn. I hope that we are obeying the command of Jesus Christ to share the gospel to people so that they may be saved, not only for our sake, because obedience to the Lord brings blessings from the Lord. Is that an amen? But more so for the sake of those who will be saved because of the gospel. The Apostle Paul writes this to Christians in Rome. Romans chapter 1, it says, in verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you. Now, what is the harvest that Paul is referring here? The harvest is what Jesus spoke about with his disciples in Matthew 9, 37. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What Paul means is the harvest of souls, just as I have had I have had among other Gentiles. From a Bible perspective, if you are not a Jew, then you are a Gentile. Paul was a Jew, as Jesus was. The Romans were not. They were Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. If I was Paul, I would say, I'm not just bringing the gospel to Filipinos like me. I am sharing the gospel to all. And this is why our vision is to create a multicultural community based on faith, by faith in Christ Jesus. Our vision is in line with Paul's vision. Amen? Our vision is in line with the commandment of Jesus Christ to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, what is the purpose of our mission? To put it simply, to save souls. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I have become all things to all people. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I may save some. He said, I do this for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. Jesus alone can save people. But Jesus cannot save people alone. Jesus needs our mouth to proclaim the gospel so people can be saved. Let me ask you, what is the most valuable possession you have? What is the most valuable possession that you have? Is it your house? Is it your car? Your investment? It's none of those. Even if you have the combined wealth of Elon Musk, of Tesla, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, and Bill Gates of Microsoft, that enormous fortune is not the most valuable possession that you have. And even if you're not one of any of those billionaires, and even if you don't have one single dollar to your name, you still own the most precious possession in the world, just like anyone else. And what is that? 
your soul. Amen? It's your soul that's the most valuable possession that you have. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 or 16, verse 26, What profits a man if he gains the whole world, yet loses his own soul? What good is it if you have billions, but in the end, you go to hell? Is anything worth more than your soul? Are you willing to exchange the wealth and the pleasures of the world for your soul? Well, millions of people in the world have done this, and they are willing to do this. Because there are so many smart people in the world who are graduates in the top universities, and they have these letters at the end of their last names. Smart people, but they constantly make foolish choices and decisions. Spending time and effort pampering and shaping your body but neglecting your soul is foolish. You know why your soul is the most precious possession that you have? It's because your soul is eternal. Everything in this world is temporal. Our body, when we die, will go back to the ground from dust to dust. But our souls will last forever. Your soul is the center of your intellect. It's the center of your emotions. It's the center of your conscience and your will. The Bible indicates that not only we do we have a body with a soul, but we are a soul with a body. In fact, your soul is the real you because your body decays, but your soul lasts forever. It's the soul that stands in, before God in judgment and therefore it's the soul that needs to be saved from the wrath of God. This is the purpose for our mission and our obedience to this mission may spell the difference between a soul that will be cursed and damned in hell or a soul that will be saved and blessed in heaven. Amen? Now, the success of our mission is not all up to us. In fact, we are not up to this task. We can't do this on our own. We don't have the strength and the resources to do it. On our own, it can't be done. And Jesus knows this, and that's why he assures us that power will be given so we can do it. Matthew 28, once again, verses 18 to 19. Then Jesus said to his disciples and, to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When you have authority, then you have the power. Authority and power, they go together. The policeman or a judge has the authority because they have the power to send anyone to jail who violates the law. So authority and power, they go together. Jesus said that he has authority in heaven and on earth because he has the power over anything and over anyone in heaven and on earth. And he assures us that he will give us this power if we are obedient to his mission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. When God calls us to do something, he gives us the power and the resources to do it. There's a story of a husband who said to his wife, I notice that you always carry a picture of me in your handbag. Why is it? And the wife said, well, whenever I have a problem, even if it's impossible, I look at your picture and my problem disappears. 
And the husband said, so is that how powerful I am to you? And the wife said, yes. I look at your picture and I say to myself, is there any greater problem than this? If I can handle this problem, I can handle any problem. <laughs> well, the power that God gives us to fulfill the mission is not something that you carry with you. It is someone that is in you. That's the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus said before he ascended to heaven to his disciples. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive what? Power. Say it with me. Power. Uh, you're powerful. Power. power. That's better. Okay, let's have some power here. <laughs> you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. In John 14 verse 17, Jesus says, that if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives with you and lives in you. And that's why Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. It's the same as make disciples. Not just in your neighborhood, in Jerusalem, but all in Judea, other cities, other provinces, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The same thing he said in Matthew 28. It takes the power of God to save us. It takes the power of God to change us. And it takes the power of God to carry out the task that has been given us. And this power is in the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Ephesians 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Now look at the amazing result when the disciples of Jesus received the power of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4. I'm just going to give you one verse. Acts 4, 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Most of us don't want to share the gospel because we're afraid. We feel that we are inadequate. We don't want to look foolish. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to be rejected. But I want to remind you that the Holy Spirit lives in you if you are a Christian. Amen? Amen? That means the power of God is in you. Now, God's power does not guarantee that people will be saved. God will not force anyone to be saved. They have to make that choice. But the power of God guarantees that you will have the resources to fulfill the mission to make disciples of all nations. God's power guarantees that you can fulfill the mission that God has given you. So just be obedient. And that's what we need in our church, isn't it? That's what we need personally. We need to be obedient to this mission. Just make a step of faith. Remember I said last Sunday, God's power along the way. God's power is not going to work until you make a step of faith. One step at a time towards the direction that God wants you to go. Make a step of faith towards that person. If he could be or she could be your 
co-worker or your friend or your neighbor or your relative. Make a step of faith. You're afraid. You are inadequate. You make a step of faith towards the person and God will give you the courage and boldness to proclaim the gospel so that that person may be saved from God's wrath and instead receive God's eternal blessings through Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, God's power is given not just so we can fulfill the mission, but also because there are dangers, opposition, and problems that come with this mission. In other words, to fulfill this task, we may have to go through hardships and difficulties, even pain and suffering. This is the price that we need to pay to achieve this mission. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 to 9, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. For God did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. Never be ashamed. God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity. Tell people about the Lord you say you believe in. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I am in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the gospel. God gives us power so we can have the boldness and the courage to proclaim the gospel, but he also gives us power so we have the courage and the strength to suffer for the gospel. There's a Christian missionary who was walking through a jungle in Africa so he can bring the gospel to a remote village. But then suddenly, out of the, from the bush, came two lions running towards him. He looked at them and he knew that these lions were hungry. And so the missionary did the thing that he knew best, to pray. He knelt down on the ground and he prayed, Lord, please help me. Do a miracle. Make Christians out of these lions, Lord, so that they don't eat me. All of a sudden, there was a miracle. The lion stopped on their tracks just feet away from the missionary. And they knelt down. And with folded pose, they also prayed. Great God. God is great. God is good. Let's thank God for our food. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, the point is, we all face many dangers and great risk in the mission field. Many of God's people are sent to difficult places in challenging situations so that they are exposed to all kinds of diseases and illnesses. And they've experienced hunger and poverty. And they struggle with physical and mental fatigue, with discouragement and despair. And they face all kinds of oppositions and threats. When you stand for God and his truth, you will have enemies soon enough. And some of these enemies do not just come from outside the church. Some of them come from inside the church. In fact, some of your greatest or fiercest critics can be found amongst those who listen to you preach every Sunday. <laughs> ah. <laughs> God has ordained that hardships, even suffering, 
is the price we pay to fulfill the Great Commission. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 16, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. I'm sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. Many people that are not yet rich with the gospel live in places and cultures that are dangerous and hostile to Christians. If you go to them and tell them that Jesus is the only way to heaven and God, you will get killed for it in those places. Nobody who believes and preaches the gospel of health, wealth, and prosperity will want to be a missionary to those places. No, the only ones who will go to those places are those who have genuine heart for God and a genuine burden for souls. If we only want a nice, easy, and comfortable Sunday service, hallelujah, if this is all we want, we will never stand up and say, Lord, send me. Why would you? Why would I want to go to a far-flung country when there is no air conditioning or heating or there is even no bread when I can have it all here? There is no going for the mission of God. There's no going for God's mission unless we want to surrender or willing to surrender our security and safety. Amen? If you are so concerned about your comfort, you will never risk your life for the gospel. And for Jesus Christ. If we live only to make our lives easier, our life will not count for eternity and for God. There's a story of a couple. They were missionaries in China in the 1900s. Their names were John and Betty Stam. They were both 25 years old. And they had one daughter, a one-year-old daughter. When the communists swept into power in China, they were taken captive. But their baby was left behind. And the communists declared in the streets that they're going to execute the foreigners because they said these foreigners have destroyed China. John and Betty Stam were stripped of their external clothing. And then John was ordered to kneel before his wife. And then a soldier with a huge sword cut the head of John. Betty did not scream. She trembled. And then she lay down over her husband's body. Then the same sword that cut the head of her husband was also lifted. And Betty, together with her husband, gave her life for the sake of the gospel. Hello to all our wonderful listeners out there. We hope you've been having a blessed weekend. As a church, we aim to bring the full word of God to all nations. And a quick and easy way you can help support this vision is by liking, sharing, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Thank you for tuning in, and God bless. Some of God's people have paid the ultimate price to fulfill the Great Commission because they knew that the price they paid for the souls of men were worth it.
if we believe that we are going to heaven, we would want others to go to heaven with us, won't we? Hello, did you hear that? If I asked you, are you sure you're going to heaven? Many of you would say, yes, I am. But if you truly believe that you're going to heaven, wouldn't you want others to go to heaven with you? Does that make sense? Especially your loved ones and your relatives, isn't it? I know if I ask you to raise your hand whether you have a loved one or relative who is not yet a Christian and therefore not going to heaven, all of you would probably raise your hand. But wouldn't you want them to go to heaven with you? Or you just want, you hate them so much that you don't want them to go them to see in heaven? I don't want my mother there. <laughs> now you don't hate them that much, right? No, you would want them to go to heaven with you and enjoy all these eternal blessings and glory that you will enjoy for eternity. If the joy of our salvation is authentic and satisfying, then we would want to pay any price for others to taste and experience the same joy of salvation. Is that an amen? Hello? Does that make sense to you? If the joy of our salvation, if you truly enjoy, oh, the joy of salvation, the joy in the Lord, if it is truly real and genuine, wouldn't you want that? Others would experience the same joy of salvation. You would be willing to pay any price for that to be possible. When your life ends, and it may be sooner than you think, what will you tell God? About what you've done for your years when you are, while well, you were on planet Earth. What will you tell God? Oh, I have a good job. A well-paying salary, a job that's uh, paying me a high salary. That's what I did most of my life on Earth, Lord. Or I have a college degree. I have money in the bank. Oh, I'm very famous in the community and people praise me for it. I have a successful career. If that's all you have to show for your life on earth, your life will not count for eternity and for God. There is nothing more important to God and eternity than the souls of men. Amen. Amen. So let me ask you, is anyone going to heaven because of you? Is anyone going to heaven because of you? If you're going to heaven, is there someone there who will come up to you when you reach heaven, who will come up to you and thank you for sharing the gospel to them so that they got saved. Oh, thank you, Lo. Thank you for sharing the gospel. I'm in heaven because of you. Oh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> thank you, I'm in hell. No, no. <laughs> no. Thank you, I'm in heaven because of you. Is there anyone, you reckon? Is there anyone that you're going to see in heaven and he's going or she is going to thank you because you shared the gospel to that person? Part of the joy and reward that you will receive in heaven is meeting people who are in heaven because of you. Amen? 
I want you to think that, to think about that question I ask you. When you go home, think, ask yourself the question, is there anyone that is in heaven or going to heaven because of me? Because I share the gospel to that person. Finally, here's the promise of God to those who are on a mission for God. His presence. Matthew 28, once again, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And here is the promise. And surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is one of the most beautiful promises of God in the Bible. And it gives it to those who obey and go. When you get involved in the great commission, you will meet opposition. But Jesus said, don't fear, I am with you. When you give to support the work of missions so that others will go to other nations and bring the gospel, you may face financial challenges and difficulties, but God says, don't worry, I will take care of you. When you go out there and preach the gospel so that all people in all the world may hear the gospel, you will be exposed to dangers and great risk, but Jesus says, don't be afraid. I will go with you. When you go and obey God, you will not be alone. No matter where you go and no matter how far you go, because God will be with you always. Not just in the end, but always to the end. Amen? I have served the Lord for more than 30 years. And in all those years, the Lord was with me. The Lord provided for me. The Lord stood by me. The Lord strengthened me so I can preach the gospel to those who are willing to listen. Jesus kept his promise. He never left me and he never will. I hope that each one of you may taste and experience the sweetness of this promise. Go and obey, and you will. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, I pray for your people here, Lord God, or those who are listening, and those who will listen to this message, that all of them will go and obey willing to pay any price, even hardships, difficulties, suffering, and pain, because the souls of men are worth the price that we will pay for. In fact, Lord, you paid for our souls with your life. We cannot save them, but Lord, you've called us. We are at your feet, we are your mouth, so we can go out there and share the gospel. If any one of us here, Lord, will answer that question, is there anyone that will go to heaven or going to heaven because of me? If the answer is no, I pray that that person this morning may be convicted by the Holy Spirit and may pray and may ask, Lord, send me Give me people, give me souls, give me the opportunity to share the gospel so that others may be saved. Let there be a sense of urgency. In fact, millions now has died and are still dying, not only because of the pandemic, but so many reasons and causes, even as we speak. And a lot of us are just content to sit down in this comfortable place. 
content with easy, nice Sunday service. Well, millions are going to hell. Lord, if this message will not convict your people, nothing will. They have become stubborn and hard-headed, stiff-necked. And I can't do no more, Lord God. I proclaim your truth. It's up to you, Holy Spirit, to change heart, to soften hard hearts, to break hearts of stone. Make them soft. Give them your love so they'll learn to love those who are lost. So Lord, Father, I commit to you everything. May you accomplish your purpose, Lord, for this message. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause.